This evening is actually what uh, I find one of the more powerful and uh, more moving, most moving services in the church here. Uh, I've mentioned to a few people that I have an app on my phone called We Croak. It's got a little picture of a green frog and it's called We Croak and you click on the We Croak thing, it opens up and then you... Uh, you set your preferences and it five times a day flashes up a notification on the, on your t on your cell phone and it says remember you're going to die open for a quote so then you open it up and you read the quote and it's always something that's thought provoking and it's a reminder of mortality and in the about you know as you have those little about things on an app uh, it says, in the country of Bhutan, it, uh, there it is a, it's a common saying that contemplating your death five times a day leads to a better life. And the We Croak app, five times a day, says, remember, you're going to die. Open for a quote. And the quotes are, thing, well, so far my favorite one is one that says, uh, I don't remember who it's quoting, but it says, don't sell your soul to buy peanuts for the monkeys. And I've, I've written a song based on that. But it, it is a reminder that we are dust, and to dust we shall return, which is the line that's used as we impose ashes. And that's what this service is doing. It's a reminder that as we enter into this solemn season of Lent, this time of reflection and prayer, that our lives are, are important. They matter. They matter to God. And they should matter to us enough for us to live on purpose. And as uh, one person I follow is fond of saying uh, that uh, he does a podcast that is about uh, making sure that you believe in life before death. And sometimes the church in the past has gotten so focused on the life after death that we don't take seriously enough the fact that we should live before we die. So this is not a morbid thing. It's not a morbid service. But it is a sober reminder that Christ came here to partake in our humanity. And the one thing that we all share in common besides taxes, is death. And it can remind us to, to take our lives seriously enough that we do live on purpose. So this is a quiet service. It's not going to take a long time. Uh, as we begin, uh, I'm not sure if, it, has everyone heard the news about Eileen Schultz? It's gone right around the community, yes. The, Sad, she was quite concerned about this operation. She knew it was going to be very major. And it was, she didn't make it off the operating table. So in the days to come, we will be welcoming her, her home. And uh, we'll see what happens and unfolds from that. But it, it, that too was a reminder to us to, to live our lives to the fullest and to take advantage of all our opportunities for ministry while we're here because there's great joy in that so the service is in the red hymnal if you want to follow along in there you can 
uh, but the words should be all up on the screen, so you shouldn't have to, to use the book at all today. And being free to do that um, lets you just give more time for quiet and contemplation. There'll be moments in the service where there'll be a, a little pause and some silence. That's not accidental. Our, our busy minds uh, can use a rest once in a while. So uh, we gather as we do all things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we gather and greet each other as is customary. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We turn to our gathering song, number 793. with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our first lesson. First lesson is from Joel chapter 2, various verses. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Like their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, 
and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Psalm today is Psalm 51 and uh, 1 to 17. And I would have you please uh, join me in speaking the verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let me teach your ways to offenders and sinners shall be restored to you. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. For you take no delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a troubled and broken heart, O God, you will not despise. This lesson is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 20b, and chapter 6, verse 10. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no, no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, and ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as pure, poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Here ends our lesson. Please stand. 
stand for the gospel acclamation. gospel lesson for this Ash Wednesday service is taken from the gospel of Matthew, sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Beware of practicing your piety before others, in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they might be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil in your head, wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consume, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. In this gospel lesson, Jesus has quite a bit to say about Abba, Daddy, our heavenly parent, the one who looks down on us with mercy and grace. And Jesus has this vision of a gracious, loving, caring parent. And it's quite in contrast to the Roman pantheon. Very, very, very different. You look at the stories of the Roman gods and they are constantly bickering with each other, fighting with each other, and humans get caught in the middle. So that's, that's the Roman theological um, imperial theodicy. Why do good things happen to bad people? Well, they just happen to be under the wrong place when the gods are stomping around fighting. And we get in the way. Well, I am very much an atheist about those gods because I don't like that image. I don't believe in that kind of God. That kind of God who blunders about just causing devastation out of pure greed and selfishness and ambition. And that's what a lot of the stories about the Roman pantheon are about. And it kind of makes sense with a steamroller empire that crushed all resistance before it. And you know, we've all heard the term the Pax Romana, right? The Roman peace, the peace of Rome. And yes, Caesar was titled the Prince of Peace. He brought peace everywhere Rome came. There was peace once all of the opposition was killed. 
If you kill all the people who oppose you, things get peaceful because your opposition's all dead. And if you can't quite kill them all, well, you just terrify them so much that they don't dare put their heads out their doors. That's what crucifixion was for. Because it was very public, incredibly brutal, and vicious, intentionally. It was a system devised to inflict the maximum amount of humiliation and agony on the way to someone's dragged out, protracted death. Very fitting for a culture that believed in gods who just don't care at all about humans for the most part. They're too busy with palace rivalries up on Mount Olympus and collateral damage amongst humans Kind of irrelevant. Don't meddle in the matters of the gods because they're not going to notice. But Jesus' vision is of Papa, our daddy, our daddy in heaven, and our father who seeks, sees in secret, who knows the very most frightened, intimidated, and boastful parts of our hearts, who sees the things that we hide from each other, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. After all, don't we every once in a while do something that surprises us? I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. Oh, what was I thinking? We have parts of ourselves that we've shoved into a closet and every once in a while, they stick their heads out and uh, throw a paper airplane at us or throw something harder at someone and hurts them. And we think, how could I have done that? And we believe in a all-knowing, compassionate one who sees all of that and chuckles. All of my kids, all of us who are parents of our seen our children do things and thought, oh, he's going to regret that tomorrow. That was not a wise decision. And you feel bad for them, and you wish them well, and you hope that they learn the first time so that they don't do it a second time. And when they do it the second time, as inevitably they sometimes do, do we stop loving them? Of course not. We don't give up. And if we are that kind of parent, would God not be as good a parent as each one of us? Certainly not. Certainly God is not less of a good parent <laughs> than any one of us but far more compassionate. God really doesn't care so much about our public image, about our Facebook profile, about how many followers we have on whatever social media platform. But God cares very deeply and passionately about what's in our hearts and about how we treat each other and about how we embody the loving acts of the one who is the lover of our souls. See, Jesus' agenda was uh, a good deal higher than that of a lot of the other spiritual leaders at the time. And when we look around at our world, we can see a lot of spiritual leaders who have very carefully crafted messages and very carefully shaped images. And then we find out after a few years what's been going on behind closed doors and in the back rooms of their large estates. And it always seems to be somewhat of a shock until we think about it and think, yeah, that happened last year with another one and two years before that with another one and six months from now probably another one because we so want and need 
the approval of those around us, don't we? Even when we're most scrupulous, we find ourselves sometimes saying things or doing things that really aren't true to our hearts because somebody's expecting it or because we know that it will make us look good. And Jesus is encouraging us to think carefully. Perhaps more importantly, feel more deeply into our heart instead of that crafty brain that's always figuring out the next social media post <laughs> and the next action in front of others. And at our best, we do it. And at our best, we lift each other up and encourage each other to do that kind of action, to act in good conscience from the heart. And when we don't, well, we gather and we confess and we commit and we hold each other to account and we encourage each other and we grow. Because just like our children, we're not quite done yet. We're still learning. We are still growing. And as long as we are on this earth, God is forming us into the kind of people that God would have us be. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. Now, some of you are probably well along the road farther than me, but I know I've got a long ways to go. I have a long ways to go. And I'm grateful that I'm being led, that I'm receiving guidance from people that I trust, and through them, from God. So the, uh, the one thing that I will mention too is that word fasting that keeps popping up all the way through these lessons. Did people notice that? Does it stick out for you? When, and it's not, if you fast, no, it didn't say that. When? When you fast. So there's an ancient tradition of doing this, and we have had that beginning yesterday, Shrove Tuesday, the day on which we emptied the kitchens, put it all out on the table, feasted, and had a big meal, and cleared out the old yeast, and made our pancakes, cleared the fat out, and now we step into this season of reflection. And I would encourage you, give some thought and some prayer. If there's something that you feel called to set aside for this season of Lent, it might be a very useful practice, especially in a society that is so devoted to consuming everything all the time. It's very countercultural and and not not a, uh, a restrictive, uh, super low calorie diet in order that you look good to other people. Because that's not the kind of fast that God requires. That's the kind that is seen before others, displayed on the streets. But something that you can do quietly between you and God and say, okay, whatever. Um, and your father, your parent, your loving parent who sees in secret will know what you're doing. If anybody notices, that's their problem. As for the false treasures of this world, we use them to buy good stuff by doing things for others. We continue on with the invitation to Lent. Friends in Christ, today, with the whole church 
we enter the time of remembering Jesus' Passover from death from into life, and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy in communion with God and with one another. So let us love one another and live in harmony with all creation. But our sinful rebellion does separate us from God, from our neighbors, and from creation, so that we do not enjoy the life that our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from the love of God and from our neighbors. Therefore, I invite you to the discipline of Lent. Self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. We continue with the confession of sin. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. I invite you to stand as you're able. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be a sign of our mortality and penitence, reminding us that only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are we given eternal life through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to come forward for the imposition of ashes. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return.
remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Let us pray. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. I ask, invite you to return. Let us pray. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to our, our hymn, number 608.
Let us pray. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew in us the gift of baptism, that we may provide for those who are poor. Pray for those in need. Fast from self-indulgence. And above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, serve and love God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.
Go in peace with rejoicing. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.